back to 410 hymn number 410 standing on the promises standing on the promises of Christ my King through eternal ages let us pray of Christ the Lord I found your him eternally by the strong cord overcoming daily with the spirit sword standing on the promises of God standing up, standing up, standing on the promises of God my Savior standing up, standing promises I cannot fall on this thing every moment to the Spirit's call resting in my Savior as my all in all standing on the promises of God Amen. You may be seated as we go into a time of prayer. Father, thank you for the privilege tonight to come into your house and to, to worship you and to hear your word uh, being spoken to us. Lord, we thank you for the nice day you've given us and uh, just for the time to be together. Lord, we do want to lift up tonight some of our... Um, Ministries that's going on, especially our target ministries that's starting tonight. We pray, Lord, for the divorce care and, and the grief share and the DC for K. We pray, Lord, that you would just be with them as they start and that you would uh, uh, use the teachers as they uh, reach out to those that are struggling in those areas. Be with them and also with our uh, youth that's meeting and our uh, wanna programs and all those that's going on lord pray that you would uh, speak to the hearts of those uh, young kids uh, be with uh, the leaders as they present the gospel do pray that you be with mark tonight as he brings us your word give him liberty to speak uh, from the heart and what you have given him for us do pray for uh, the billy blankenship's family we're saddened that uh, She's gone on with you, but we rejoice in the fact that she is with you. And we just pray, Lord, that you would be with the family as they have visitation tomorrow night and the, the funeral Friday. Pray, Lord, that you give them peace and comfort. And, uh, Lord, we just pray that you would, uh, again, be with us, be with our church, be with Pastor Dan as he uh, is having the 201 class tonight, uh, that you would use him as he speaks to those that are in that class. I do ask these things in your son's name. 
Father, we are grateful to you tonight for the fact that your promises present for us, give to us such a, a firm foundation to stand on and that we can stand on your promises, trusting you. May we understand better and learn to trust more fully in your word and your promises to us. Thank you for your presence. Thank you, Father, that you are always with us, that your spirit is there to encourage and comfort, strengthen and help us each day and to guide our paths. And we pray that we will be receptive to your leading and follow you fully. Lord, we thank you for all of our missionaries. We thank you for Carolina University and pray for your blessing upon that institution and provide all that is needed by way of personnel and resources to train up a generation of Christ followers who will impact their world for you. We pray, Father, for Glenn and Tammy Claudio. Thank you for their many years of ministry in Spain, and we thank you for how you're using them here in the States and Hispanic ministries. We pray for your blessing upon them and protection in their lives. Lord, we especially pray for Neato and Arisa Funada and for Joe and Noni Mita, for the two little boys. Lord, we ask for a special sense of your presence in their lives right now. Lord, we know that you in your sovereignty and your wisdom, your knowledge, we know that you have all power. And if you saw fit, you could immediately heal Erisa and spare her life, give her a long ministry with her family in Japan. Lord, there are things that happen that we don't fully grasp and understand. If you do not choose to heal her, we ask, Lord, that you will give the family grace. We know your grace is sufficient. May they lean heavily upon you. May they recognize that underneath are the everlasting arms, the eternal God is our refuge. And I pray, Father, you will give them your sustaining grace and comfort and wisdom. Father, we pray for our country and our world. Lord, it is often difficult to know what to pray, but we pray, Father, for revival in the hearts of every believer, every church, so that we might be prepared for whatever we're called upon to face in the days ahead. And we pray, Father, for the coming of the Prince of Peace who will bring peace to this world and set up his kingdom of eternal righteousness and justice and peace. Father, we pray for uh, the, the Carol Richards family. We pray for Dave and for the children, the grandchildren, that you would give them your peace and comfort and encourage them this day. We pray for Eugene Broyles, that he will recover fully and be able to get the, uh, the help he needs in rehab. For Ken Engel, Lord, we pray for both physical and spiritual needs there, that you would be at work in his life. For Marvin Harry and Jamie Hypes and Susan Owen, uh, Robin uh, Pruett, we pray, Father, that you would minister to the needs of each of them, bring them back to full health if it would please you. We also thank you that Blake Farley is home and pray that his recovery would continue well, that he'll be able to, to be back with us before long. For Allison Huffman and Lois Petrie, continue to bless them with strength and to return to full health if it would please you. Father, we thank you for our brother Mark and for his uh, ministry, for his experience and time in, in the pastorate and, and also in Christian school administration for his love for you, his love for your word. Bless him now with clarity of thought, freedom of expression, the power of your spirit as he brings your word to us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you have your Bibles, if you want to go ahead and turn to uh, 1 Samuel 24, we're going to start there. And... Uh, 1 Samuel 24, and um, I'm thankful to uh, be here, and hopefully uh, next few minutes will prove uh, beneficial. Um, it's been 
um, good for me as I've been directed towards what we're going to look at. So I've already gained, and I have much work to do as I move forward as I think through this further into the future. So I'm looking forward to our time uh, together. When Trish and I first got married, um, our TV probably did not move too much from ESPN. I mean, it just didn't matter what was on ESPN. I could watch it, and uh, my wife didn't grow up in a family that had that option for watching that much television and sports. And, you know, she was amazed at how often I could just watch dogs weaving out of obstacle courses, right? Um, all kinds of interesting things. Um, now, you know, I can't hardly sit down to watch my favorite team without my wife coming in in two minutes hearing me snore saying, are you watching it? I'm like, yeah, I'm watching You're right. I can't even stay away hardly. But in the early days, those, those there were several things that interest me. You'd think maybe they're kind of youth group, youth pastor kind of, kind of youth room games, right? I love ping pong. And I love pool. I love ping pong. I'm not good at either. Not good at either. But I, I love them. And it was, I just, I enjoyed watching people who were really good at those two things. I, I just enjoyed watching them. And some get really good. And you can eke out some type of a living on both of those things on a, on a pro tour, right? There's a pro ping pong tour and there's a pro billiards or pro pool tour. And um, I just enjoyed watching them. And, and I especially enjoyed watching um, uh, pool. And uh, my family had an opportunity just over, what was last, Christmas maybe? Christmas. We were at some family's house, and, and they had a pool table, and we were playing. I'm, I'm telling you right now, if you want someone to have to re-rack and re-break, have me be the person to break. I, I'm not any good. I'm just, I'm just, it's fun. I'm just not any good at pool. I don't know how much you know about the game. I, I enjoy trying. I have a math brain, so I like thinking about angles. It hardly ever comes off. Um, I love pool. Um, but there are people who are really good at it, right? They're professionals, and they know what they're doing, right? And basic rules of certain pool is you have someone who will start off, and, and you either have certain colors that you have to go in order, certain numbers you have to go in order, depending on what, what you're playing or certain stripes. And if, if someone is really good, if they are a pro, and if you've ever seen pros on television, and, and it's racked and they break it, and, and it, it's like, Ball's going everywhere, and it's set up, and if one of those falls into the hole, they get to keep going, and it's not uncommon for a pool player to be able to just to run the table. So I'm playing um, Trisha because just looking at Trisha, she's a pool shark, right? And so I'm up against Trisha. So Trisha breaks it, ball goes in the hole, and it's my turn. I'm waiting for my turn, and she just runs the table. And I never get a chance because she's just so good at working her way around the table that the other person, they just never get a shot. Now, they played a certain degree, so I eventually would get a shot. But in that instant, on that particular game, I wouldn't even get a shot. Now, occasionally, things will work out, right, to where she's done everything she can, right, and she's moving. And, and she realizes, I'm not going to be able to finish this table. I'm going to have to let my opponent. I'm going to have to let my husband take a turn. But I don't want him to have a good shot. Right? I don't want him to have a good shot. So pros are able to play defense and take a pull ball and position it in such a way that is absolutely impossible for me to make a play. Have you ever heard the term of what that's called? Does anybody know what that's called? Somebody's got to know. Have you ever heard the word snookered? Right, snookered. That's what it is. That's, there's actually a billiard game called snooker, but in, in normal pull, that's what it is. It's when she would play defense to the point that I know I have to hit the pool ball over there, but there's an obstruction in front of me that has so trapped me, I have zero good options. Zero. I am trapped. You have to commit a foul, so what I would have to do is hit the ball in front of me, which is not the one I'm supposed to hit, 
And then Trisha gets to say, ha ha. And then she gets to take over and then run the table and I lose. I got snookered, right? No good option. There, I'm standing here and the things that have been placed in front of me, right, have me trapped, right? Have you, have you ever felt in a situation, have you ever felt that you were in a place where you were trapped, right? You were snookered, no options. Whatever move you make, it's going to be the wrong one. And it feels like whatever I do, it's going to give somebody else an opportunity to do something else. And I just, what am I supposed to do? I'm just trapped. Right now, I, I, I'm using the word snookered because it sounds, you know, just fun to say, right? Snookered, snickers, snookered. But Christians aren't, right? Everyone in this room, right? This is the grow class. This is the class that thinks enough about being in church on Wednesday night. It is unspiritual to say you're trapped because that's just doubting God. Well, I can't say I'm trapped, right? But hey, we felt it, right? We're in a position where we feel like it doesn't matter what I do. It's the wrong answer. I'm trapped. I am snookered. Now, here's the question I want us to think about just for a minute as we move forward. What do you do is as you think through and process that thing, that circumstance, and you come to the conclusion that you've actually been snookered by God. I mean, you've been placed into a situation where it seems like you're trapped and you have no options, but the pool player is not circumstances. It's not an enemy. It, it's God. Right, well, would God do this? Would God actually have the people he loves be put into a situation to where it almost feels like I don't have an answer? What am I supposed to do? I'm trapped. I am snookered. And if he would do it, why would he do it? Well, that's, that's why I had you turn to 1 Samuel chapter 24. I, I believe sometimes he does that. And David is a good example. Think about it. Think about David right? He was anointed king. Shortly after that, he kills Goliath, right? Things seem to be going well. It's rocky, but even Saul recognizes his ministry and music is there to help calm him down. So he's called to the king's palace to help at the request. It seems like everything is going in his favor. Everything is working out. He's trying to live out that life where he's a man after God's own heart. And yet he then spends the next part of his life fleeing from David. Everything was going well, but now he's fleeing, right? And that takes us to 1 Samuel chapter 24, where he's literally trapped, right? Let's read the first few verses of 1 Samuel 24. After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, David is in the desert of En Gedi, Right, so Saul took 3,000 able young men from all of Israel and set out to look for David. Oh my goodness. Right? 3,000 men on speed dial. We got to go get that. I, when I read this, I was like, okay, I know Saul chased him. He went out and got 3,000 people to go chase him. Okay? And they, they were near the crags of the of the wild goats. That's awesome. The crags of the wild goats. It sounds like a, I don't know, a restaurant. Crags of the wild goat. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there and Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. He's trapped. He's in the back of the cave. The men said, this is the day, Dave's mighty men said, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept up and noticed and cut off the corner of Saul's robe. Afterwards, David's conscience was stricken from having cut off the corner of his robe. And he said to his mighty men, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master. The Lord's anointed or lay my hand on him, for he is anointed of the Lord. With these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went his way. And David went out of the cave and called out to Saul, My lord the king. 
When Saul looked behind him, David bowed down and prostrated himself uh, with his face to the ground. And he said to Saul, why do you listen when men say, David is bent on harming you? This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lay my hand on my Lord because he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe, but I did not kill you. See that there's nothing in my hand to indicate that I'm guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me, but my hands will not touch you. As the old saying goes, from evildoers come evil deeds, so my hands will not touch you. Against whom has the king of Israel come out? Who are you pursuing? A dead dog? A flea? May the Lord be our judge and decide between us. May he consider my cause and uphold it. May he vindicate me by delivering me from your hand. So here's the situation. David was in the favor of God with anointed, killed Goliath, and now he finds himself trapped and on the run with mighty men in his ear, kill him. Here's the time, here's the time, here's the time. And David's like, well, if I do that, then I I go against God. I go get my conscience. But if I just let him go, we know that at the end of this, Saul just didn't say, you know what, David? You're right. Let's shake hands and let's move on. Hey, I might as well step down. I know you're going to be the king. He still has many more opportunities where this decision didn't necessarily seem to work out in the way he was supposed to do. God had led David, at the very least, he allowed, God had led David to cave where he was literally trapped. What do you do when, like David, you are providentially or divinely snookered? Now, you know, there may be things in your life right now that you simply don't understand how you got there, but you're there, and you don't know answers. You don't know what to do. How should you live your life? How should I live my life when we're seemingly put into a position without answer? Well, here's what David did. He wrote a song. He wrote a song. Psalm 57, all right? He wrote a song. I'm convinced, right? I I lose my man card by admitting this, um, but I love musicals. Right? I, I think when we get to heaven and get to see the video of those things, I mean, it's going to be a musical. I mean, how many things do we read in the Psalms where David had an event and then he wrote a song? Right? So uh, he gave us a Psalm, Psalm 57, to help us see how he processed what it was like when he was divinely put in a place where he felt trapped. So let's read that. Right? The heading says, For the director of music, to the tune of Do Not Destroy, I have no idea what that tune is, of David, a Micatum, when he had fled from Saul into the cave. Here's what he said. Have mercy on me, my God, have mercy on me, for in you I take refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the distress is past. I cried out to God most high, to God who vindicates me. He sends from heaven and saves me, rebuking those who hotly pursue me. God sends forth his love and his faithfulness. I'm in the midst of lions. I am forced to dwell among ravenous beasts, men whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. That's our chorus into the first stanza. Next one. They spread a net for my feet. I was bowed down in distress. They dug a pit in my path, but they have fallen in it themselves. My heart, O God, is steadfast. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make music. Awake, my soul. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the sky. And our chorus, again, be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. David tells us in his mind's process, when he got backed into a corner in a cave where he didn't feel like he had a choice, here's what I'm going to do, right? So here's my outline, and then we'll fill it out. Here's my outline for 
tonight. What are you supposed to do when you feel like God or providence has put you in a place where you're snookered? Number one, realize that there is actual pressure. Realize that there is pressure in being divinely snookered. Number two, refocus your practice of life when divinely snookered. And then number three, rejoice in the purpose of being divinely snookered, all right? So that's the outline, so let's get right to it. David was in that position with Saul, and he writes a song, and the very first thing he tells us is, guys, this is real, right? There's no shame and no harm, and it's actually bad for us to just believe in those instances I got this. Number one, we should realize that there is actual pressure in being divinely snookered, right? David did in verses four and six. Number one, he acknowledged that pressure was present. And number two, he acknowledged that pressure is often personal, right? Let's look at verses four and six. David says this. This is the problem. He's trapped, I am in the midst of lions. I am forced to dwell among ravenous beasts, men whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. Verse 6, these same people spread a net for my feet. I was bowed down in distress. They dug a pit in my path. When we find ourselves trapped, it's too easy, if we're not careful, just to pretend everything is okay. It doesn't do us any good to pretend like, well, we've got it under control. It's very important in those times for us to admit, okay, I'm in a place where I have no answers. Because it's only after that that we will actually seek an answer to the difficulty that is in front of us. When we are trapped, when we feel like we have no answers, so often pride is our number one enemy. I got this. I got this. I can handle it. I mean, after all, I got up and I picked out my pants and my shirt today. Right? I got in the car. I came to a stoplight. I stopped. Look, I'm good. I can handle issues, right? My GPS said there was trouble ahead, and it said it was going to take me an hour if I stayed in line, and an hour and 20 if I got out of line. So I I picked an hour and 20 because at least I'm moving, right? I'm not stopped. We all have ways of processing I can handle problems. There's times in your life to where you honestly are given. David is not painting a situation here that is your everyday run-of-the-mill problem. You're trapped. You're snookered. You don't have answers. And there's real pressure there, so just acknowledge it. It's here. I need help. David also said it's important in that pressure to acknowledge that Quite frankly, a lot of times, the pressure is often very personal, right? All problems hurt, but personal ones seem to to cut a little bit more. Why are they doing this to me? That's the thought. I'm trapped. I'm in the circumstance. There's a personal nature to it. Why are they doing this to me, right? And we know that not everyone is, is innocent, But there are instances in which we're innocent. There's nothing within this context that tells us that David had done anything wrong to be on the run from Saul. And yet he found himself on the run from Saul. Same with Job, many other circumstances. So the first thing David in his psalm would have us do is, look, it's not wrong. It's actually important so that we know how to begin to move forward by actually acknowledging that you're trapped. You know, those personal attacks, right? Our culture has made slander just way too easily with so seemingly little consequence. We can say whatever we want about whoever we want, 
and have no fear of how that's going to come back and hurt us. And yet you may find yourself in a spot to where you did everything that you should have in the way that you should have done, and yet it's misunderstood, and now this onslaught just comes. Right? The hardest thing for me to do is to admit I need help. Right? It is. My wife is probably tired of hearing my comes backs when she's like, well, hey, why don't you just call so-and-so? And I'm like, yeah, they got stuff to do, right? Because I, I don't want to ask for help. I don't want to admit I'm in, in, in trouble. I don't want to admit I'm trapped. Yet the first step for us in moving through that is just, hey, let's acknowledge that the pressure is real, all right? So what am I to do when I finally realize that I'm in a position that desperately needs help? Well, that's number two. Number one, when we find ourselves divinely snookered, recognize that there's real pressure. But number two, we then need to refocus your practices of life when you're divinely snookered. Now, I use that word intentionally, not just because it starts with an R and the rest of them start with an R. That works. But I'm hopeful that these patterns are a part of your life. What happens is that when we find ourselves trapped, these are the things that we tend to let go of and we need to refocus. These are the things that tend to be normal habits in our life if we're growing and following God. But when we find ourselves trapped, we just, we, we lose it. We, we lose focus. So it takes a refocusing of practices in our life that will help us as we move forward, right? And those things are praying, pursuing God, right? And praising God, right? So I'm trapped. So what am I going to do? I'm going to pray. I'm going to pursue God, and I'm going to praise God. So first of all, he he prays. When I say refocus your practices, when you find yourself in a position, you feel like you have no options, pray. Pray. That's what Paul, or uh, that's what David did in the first three verses of our psalm, right? Let's read them, one and three, one to three. He's praying to God, have mercy on me, my God, have mercy on me. For in you, I take refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings, until the disaster has passed, I cry out to God most high. That, that is the sovereignty of God, God most high. He knows who to go to for answers. I cry out to God most high, to God who vindicates me. He sends from heaven and saves me, rebuking those who hotly pursue me. Pray. Pray. When I find myself trapped, God is not offended with me saying, God, I'm trapped. But isn't that a lack of faith, especially if it seems like the only thing you can fall back on is God allowed it, God orchestrated it? He knows. Yeah, but the very act of me praying and saying, God, I need help, I'm trapped, is the exact thing that allows God to start moving in our lives. It's the definition of removing pride. I am. I need help. David specifically prayed for two things. He prayed for favor and freedom. Favor and freedom. Give me mercy. Right? In your innocence, don't forget you need mercy and grace. You need favor. You need God to bring into your life those things that birthed you into his family. Mercy and and grace. Those aren't things that are just there at the cross. They're there for us every day. Lord, I'm trapped. I need your favor. I need mercy. I need grace. David also, though, prayed for freedom. This is not wrong. It's okay to pray for vindication. It's okay to pray for relief, right? Even if God chooses not to give it at that particular time. David prayed for mercy, right? He prayed for vindication, um, he prayed for relief. Lord, if there's any way that you can take what's going on with these people who are pursuing me, I, I would like that. <laughs> I would like that. It's okay. Stop. Pray. Ask God for favor. Ask God for freedom. Pray for mercy. Pray for relief. Then what? Well, once you get off your knees, pursue God. That's what he did. He pursued God for protection and provision. So go about your day 
pursuing God. And hopefully we're doing that. But like I said, when we find ourselves trapped, it's those things in life that we know to do that so often we let go of. I've prayed. Now I'm going to get up and I'm going to go about my day and I'm going to pursue God. Right? Verse 1, have mercy on me. My God, have mercy on me. So what's he going to do? I'm going to take refuge in you. I'm going to take refuge in the shadow of your rings until the distress has passed. I'm going to pursue you for protection, for provision. What, what do I need protected from? Right, a lot of times it's not going to be physical things. Hopefully people aren't beating us up, right? A lot of times in these situations where we feel trapped, you know what needs protected? My heart and my mind. That's what needs protected. My mind can go a thousand different places when I'm trapped. Why me? What are they doing? This is not fair, right? But running to God allows me to remember, okay, he'll protect me. He'll protect my mind. He'll protect my heart, right? He'll make sure that as long as I'm pursuing him, even if there's times of vulnerability where I don't understand, he's going to draw me to him. He's going to provide the right way to think about those things. Pursue God specifically in that time for protection of your heart and mind and provision for the right way to think about the circumstance. My natural response when slandered is to what? It is to slander. I don't know if that's you. Hey, Mr. Patton, did you hear what such and such said? Well, do you know this about them? Right? I, I, can't, I can't repay evil for evil. Right? My wife is our, our school secretary, and every morning for announcements, she writes at the top of the verse or the, the page verses for us to consider, and then she usually pulls out a quote for us um, just to think about, right? And I'm convinced she pulls them out and writes them like for me. So Mark needs this today, right? One of our quotes last week was this, right? Wrong is wrong no matter how many people are doing it and right is right if no one else is doing it, right? Bible tells us repay no, eat, no man evil for evil. My natural inclination left to my own devices and in my own mind is when slandered, I'm going to slander, right? When lied about, I'm going to do all my energy into making sure that everybody knows. It's like, now, am I saying we can't take steps to make truth known? No, right? But in many cases, the answer is just to why we feel trapped, right? We don't want to make a snap decision. So let's pray. Lord, please give me favor. Give me freedom. But then I get off my knees and I just pursue God. Protect my heart. I'm coming to you under your wing so that you can protect my heart and mind and you can provide the right way to think about it. Now that, I've been in church, right? The first place I went after the hospital was the church nursery. So almost going 50 years. So I, it doesn't mean that I just sit in a dark room and try to, to bring back thoughts. It's an active pursuit of God, which we know is found in his word. Lord, help me. We, we go to the word. We pray. We pursue God. But maybe the hardest part is in that trapped position, right? I, I didn't realize um, until I started, and I'm just teasing. Middle schoolers are my people, right? I have a Bible class at MCA with 46, 6th, 7th, and 8th graders. I, I do. I love them. Um, some days, though, I didn't realize how much of an Eeyore I am when, when I'm, I'm with them. So I can lean towards Eeyore. I don't know if that's you or not. So my natural tendency in the midst of being trapped is to make sure you know. All right, I'm going to be Eeyore. You better know this. And that's not what David did. He prayed, he pursued God, but then he praised God. He praised God privately and publicly. Look at verses 7 through 10. My heart, O oh God, is steadfast. 
My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make music. Awake my soul, awake harp and lyre. I will awake in the dawn. I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love. Reaching to the heavens, your faithfulness reaches to the sky. He prayed, he got up and he pursued God, and then he went about his day praising God privately and publicly. Now, how's that going to work? Well, his attitude has to be steadfast. This takes a commitment to steadfastness. By God's grace, I will praise him. I will praise him, right? If this ends, I can find the worst possible way that every situation is going to turn out and then mull over that for 15 minutes in English teachers, I can find a worser way and mull that for 15 minutes and then I can go further. No, okay, I'm not going to do that. Even if it ends up in my worser way, the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed me from all sins, and I get to spend forever with Jesus in heaven, right? I got to figure out a way to be steadfast in praising God, even when I feel like I'm snookered, even when I feel trapped. And... I almost said, sorry, I'm, I'm not sorry. I don't necessarily know how to, how to say, I believe this with all my heart. I believe this with all my heart. This is the divinely inspired word of God. I don't think I'm reading too much into it. Music is going to be a part of that. Music is going to be a big part of you praising Right? And I know you're sitting there thinking, oh, it's just because you love music. Yeah, maybe. I do. I love music. But I'm telling you what, being able to praise God not only privately and publicly, many times comes with music. And his theme, and many times, will often be about God's love and faithfulness. What do I need? I need God's love when I'm trapped. I need to be reminded that God is faithful, right? Right, this is where music choices, they, they matter. They matter, right? I, I'm not a um, K-Love only station, right? That's not, I don't have one push K-Love, two K-Love, three, right? We're on different places. and um, But I'm telling you right now, when you're trapped, Right, there's not probably too many oldies or country songs that's going to get you in the right frame of mind to get untrapped. Right, it's probably just going to remind you that all your exes are in Texas. Right, you need something to add with the word of God that's going to remind you God loves me, He is faithful to me. Right. And again, none of these are earth shouting. Hey, I never thought as a Christian that I should pray and pursue God and praise him. Right? There's nothing new. But it's those things right there that as soon as you feel trapped, you start reaching for the me. Okay, what can I do? What can I do? And we forget to slow down, pray, pursue God, and just praise him. Refocus. So what is my hope in the midst of waiting to be delivered? Right? So I'm trapped. I've recognized, okay, this pressure is real. I'm praying about it. I'm going to pursue God for protecting my mind, you know, help me the right way to think about it, provide that for me. I want to praise him so then everybody knows that I'm still going to praise God. I don't want to be that sourpuss that people see coming. It's like, oh, Eeyore, wonder what's happening to him, right? He's in a tough job and he's going to let you know about it, right? I, no, I want to praise God publicly, privately. What do I do? Well, there's hope. David actually reminds us what God is doing in the midst. So that's point three. Rejoice in the purposes of being divinely snookered. Rejoice. Here's what God is doing. All right. Number one, 
Being trapped or snookered, being divinely snookered, is an opportunity for God to reveal himself more deeply to you. The very reason he trapped you may be because he's got something he needs to give you. And you're too busy moving around. So he's got to get you right where he needs you. Look at verse 3, the very last part. David's talking about how he cries out. He's, he's wanting vindication. And then he just simply says this. You know what? God does send forth his love and faithfulness to me. Even in this moment, God sent forth his love and faithfulness. Look at verse 10. David acknowledges through all of this, for great is your love. It's reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the sky. David acknowledged, right, that being trapped in this trial allowed him to learn more about God. That should, that should sound a little bit familiar. We're not going to turn there, but you remember in James chapter 1, if, if you remember that and write it down, where it's tell, telling you to count it all joy when you enter different types of testings and trial. Right? And it says this, because when that happens, you're going to gain perseverance, and when you gain perseverance, it's going to help you mature, and when you gain maturity, you're going to get wisdom. Oftentimes, a snookering, oftentimes a trapping comes right at the beginning of an opportunity where you're going to have to persevere with some maturity and display some wisdom in an important matter. And he's going to give it to you. Right? There are some of you who are ready to be wonderful counselors to people around you solely because you were trapped in the path. And you slowed down and you were able to help people understand, you know what? God revealed himself to me in a way that helped. But it's not just that. It's not just an opportunity for God to reveal himself to you. It's a wonderful opportunity for God to reveal himself to others. That's our chorus, right? Verse 5, be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Verse 11, be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Theologians have, throughout the ages, taken to describing certain things with this idea of a primary cause and a secondary cause, right? And I'm not going to really get into it. But there's just a whole lot of things that, humanly speaking, the answer is the Sunday school God. But then there's another answer that's the secondary reason, and we tend to focus on that, right? Right. For instance, I don't have it. I, I probably I just thought of this off the top of my head, so I blew it. Um, Al, you do such a great job as a teacher. You you wouldn't have blown this. You would have gotten this one right. You would have had the illustration perfect, right? So the kid comes up to you and says, um, "Why is the sky blue?" Right? Right? We can God. Yeah, that's right. He's the primary cause. Right? But then there's a scientific way to explain it that talks about why the sky is, well, it's not really, right? And we can talk through all of that stuff, right? What happens a lot of times in life is we get so used to explaining things through secondary causes that we forget that the primary cause of all things is God. And there's sometimes where God wants to allow us to be the agent where he puts us in a corner to where we're trapped that we can't rely on secondary causes and we're left with just saying, God. God. And he couldn't have done that because God has made some amazing people with amazing abilities and with amazing talent that he uses for him. And he's not against that in any way, shape, or form, but it's too easy to say, well, the church grew because the pastor has wonderful administration and wonderful preaching. And, one, and those may be true. That may be an avenue. There may be all kinds of different things that God uses. But sometimes he desires to be exalted above the heavens and for his glory to fill the earth by putting us in a position to where we're literally like, oh, I was trapped. God did it. God did it. Right? It's an opportunity. 
for him to come into my life and minister to me. And it's ultimately an opportunity for him to minister to the world. So, next time, hopefully in a long time, right? Because the pressures are real. I hope no one is trapped. I don't wish that on anyone, but God does that providentially for our glory, uh, our good and his glory, right? It's pressure's real, but don't forget to pray, to pursue God, to praise him. And remember, he's there to minister in your life and use that opportunity to minister to others. Someone has quoted Spurgeon. Somebody's given Charles Spurgeon the credit for saying this. As sure as God puts his children in the furnace... He will be in the furnace with. So it's not like God gets up and leaves the table when you've been snookered. He's going to tell you how this is going to work out. He, you know, it may be a while. Paul, Paul had to keep the thorn in the flesh. But in so many other instances, God makes a way. So trap, pray, pursue God, praise Him, knowing good and well. He's going to use it. All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you. Lord, we thank you for your mercy. And Lord, I pray that you would help all of us if we find ourselves in times of being trapped, Lord, that we would run to you for protection. Lord, guard our hearts, guard our minds. Lord, provide us with the biblical right way to think of things. Lord, I pray that we would would just uh, pursue you, that, Lord, we would just pray. Pour our hearts out to you, Lord. We would need favor, mercy, freedom. Lord, ultimately, though, that we would spend our days praising you because you are praiseworthy. Lord, we love you and we thank you. Lord, I pray that you give us a good evening in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thank you guys so much for, for listening.